Hundreds gathered to voice their anger after a George Floyd, a black man, died while in police custody. In Minneapolis tonight, tensions are high as four police officers have been fired after a man was pinned to the ground and died. For at least three minutes on the video, the man pleads for help, saying he could breathe at least a dozen times. Protests of the death of George Floyd in cities from coast to coast. Peaceful protests mark as violence erupts, stores looted and destroyed, vehicles set on fire. This is State Representative Cam Buckner. We all have watched as our country has dealt with violence that has gripped us for many years. Violence that has been perpetuated by law enforcement and suffered by black folks. This country has always done a complicated and difficult dance with race. And this includes the relationship between black people and law enforcement. I brought together black men from different groups, different backgrounds, teachers, cops, former cops, community leaders, to talk about where we've been, where we are, and what's next. To my left is Pops a retired police officer who spent 23 years on the force. And next to him is Marcus, a community organizer who works in real estate. Across from him is Eric. Eric has spent four years as a Chicago police officer. Across from me is Dino. He's an educator in the Gary Public School District. Next to me is Jerron. Jerron has spent four years as a Chicago police detective and 14 years on the force. This is Black and Blue. had the opportunity and the chance and the time to um, come out and, and chop it up with with us on this thing. Um, we know on May 25th in Minneapolis, George Floyd uh, lost his life um, by a Minneapolis police officer. And we saw what happened in our city and our neighborhoods and we saw the uproar around the country and the racial unrest. I think we all at this table also know that uh, all of that wasn't just about George Floyd. It was about the things that we've seen throughout um, our lifetimes when it comes to things that happen with black men in law enforcement uh, across the country. We know that you know in October of 2014, Laquan McDonald had the same fate happen to him here in this in this city. Uh, and so, my occupational role um, as a legislator, I write laws, vote on laws that uh, mandate and dictate what the police can and cannot do. In my role as a as a person, I'm a black man who grew up in Chicago and who has had a number of unfortunate run-ins with law enforcement, including just recently. Uh, I had an issue where I was profiled and I was asked by a cop uh, whether or not I bought the things in my cart and was told that I look suspicious because I have a mask on, right? Um, and so that, that's happened to me a number of times throughout my life from the age of 13 until just this May. Um, and as my, in my role as a as a family member, uh, I'm the I'm the son of a law enforcement officer. My dad spent 30 plus years with the Cook County Sheriff's Department. Um, I have two uncles that work for CPD, uh, and so I come to this with a kind of nuanced understanding of the balance and the you know the situation, the push and pull between us, black men, right, and law enforcement. Uh, the reason I wanted to pull this group together is because I've had a lot of conversations during this time with. Uh, with men who have tried to wrap their brain around the logic and how we move from our reality into a better spot. And some of these conversations have had so many answers in them that I wish people could hear. This is why I asked y'all to come and, and have this conversation with me on camera. All right, so this is extremely uncut, it's unscripted. Uh, we're just having a conversation. Uh, and I, you know, I really want to lean on your experiences and your understanding of the situation to t be able to take us to a better spot. So. I kind of want to start where this all usually starts, right? And, and that's the talk, right? And I feel like before some of this stuff came to the forefront, a lot of my friends, colleagues of different races did not know what the talk was, right? They had never heard of it. It wasn't a thing in their mind, but it was something that was ubiquitous for black folks. Everybody knew what the talk was. Every, everybody had either given the talk or gotten the talk. And the talk is um, something that's uh, pivotal for our survival in, in this society. So, Pop, I'm going to start with you. Uh, well, what's the first time you had to talk, and what was it like? Had, uh, the first time I actually, well, the first time I had to talk was when we moved, really, in Bethel. But I didn't get into the serious talk until they got to be teenagers. And I'm talking about when they got to about 12, not when they was 13, 11 and 12, 
I start trying to make them conscious of the fact that when you go out, you got to be careful of what you do. And if a police officer stops you, even though you know your dad is the police, what I need you to do is to look at them, identify what their name tag says, if they, and, and, and ask them for their badge number. I said, because then, as soon as you ask them for their badge number, they're going to know automatically that you know somebody that's the police. I said, just say yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, and just ask them, why did you stop me? You know, just ask them. You know, and then always, if you can acknowledge them, if you can say their name, just say, hey, Officer Johnson. And if you see their badge number, just say 15897. Uh, what did you stop me for, sir? And just shut up and see what they say. But I had to let them know that there were powers out here that was going to always be working against them. Let me, what, did, did, did you get to talk as a kid? I got to talk as a kid. Uh, basically, as a matter of fact, I got hit. That's what taught me. I was in the fifth grade and I was going to a uh, mixed school and a police officer just got out the car and just told us to keep walking. Now mind you, none of us were standing still. We were all walking and he just came up behind me since I was the biggest one and hit me on my thigh with a baton and told me to keep walking. And I just looked at him. But, uh, and I was mad, but I knew that if I'd have said anything, it, it, it was going to be worse. But then my uh, my mother, she sat me down when I told her what had happened. And that's when she told me. She was glad I didn't say nothing. But what she told me at the same time was like, whenever you get approached by a police officer, you got to say yes, sir, and, and no, sir. But she didn't understand what I what I was uh, what I was feeling at that point in time because I felt it was unfair for me to have to do that because all I kept hearing all my white friends say my dad is the police. Earlier we were, we were rapping about the normalization of violence in our communities and, and Jerron you were talking just about how um, it it really becomes something that gets embedded in the psyche of our of our people. Um, but Marcus when we were talking three or four days ago you made a statement that really struck out to me and you were saying that even in Chicago's most violent neighborhoods, whether we're talking about Roseland or Inglewood or Austin, that many times the first time that a black man has a gun put on him, it's not by his neighbor or the dude across the street or the dude from the rival gang, it's, it's by a cop. Right? Can you expound on that a little bit? Because that, that was actually really deep to me. So, when we were discussing the normalization of violence, I was uh, talking about emasculation. That, I think that was the premise I was speaking about. So uh, what I was saying was that when you're emasculated as a man, you, you tend to respond with hyper-emasculation. So if you're put in a situation where you can't defend yourself, you defend yourself more in every other situation where you feel like you can or you have a fair chance at fighting. So like, um, I was on, on the, was it Juneteenth? Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm talking to the guys out there, and I and I have the recording with me. So I start recording the first time they had a gun pulled on me. And the average age was about like 10 to 16. The first time it happened, it really didn't feel, it, I, I can't even really say I felt like something different was after that point. You know what I'm saying? But I do know I had no fear of guns being pointed at me the same way I may have had had I never had that happen. You know what I mean? And I knew I was defenseless. I knew it was nothing I could do in that moment. We talk a whole lot about like what, what we can do in our perspective roles, right? To, to change things. And I'll tell you, I, I tip my hat to, to you, to E, to Pops, um, because I, I know the existence y'all live in can be a normal one. Right. Um, it reminds me of uh, Du Bois talks about double consciousness, right? The duality of being, back then he said a Negro, but being black and American at the same time and how, what's the push and pull on that? And being a black male that grew up on the South Side over East and, and you know, seeing the things that you, that you saw, uh, but also now being, um, you know, wearing, wearing the badge. Do you feel an extra responsibility? How does that feel? I mean, what's that burden like? Um, I definitely think it's an extra responsibility that comes with it. Uh, you have to really 
embody what you're trying to do as a, as a law enforcement officer. You know, I don't think that I'm above the law, you know, at all, but I also realize that with that authority comes responsibility. And at this point in my career, I'm a detective. I, do, I handle aggravated batteries, people getting shot. Um, and my goal is always to not re-victimize the victim. Most of my victims are convicted felons. They have rap sheets long as this pavement. But in my mind, they're my victim. So I go to bat for them regardless. You know, I try not to look at their rap sheet. I mean, I have to because it's in the report, but I don't try to judge them. Right. I've had incidents of individuals that have the longest rap sheets that you can imagine, but maybe just not saying it was me, but treating them with that respect and that dignity allow for, you know, for them to feel differently because they may have never had a positive experience with the police. As a law enforcement officer, in this city, you have a great responsibility, and that's just to uphold the standard of the badge. You know, we've been going through a rough patch, um, you know, with the COVID and the civil unrest, but I'm not going to say you sign up for it, but like I said, I take the good with the bad. And in order for me to do this job without losing sleep, I have to treat people right. Yeah. You know, whether they treat me right or not, if you take me there, then. Yeah, it might go there, yeah. but to start out that way, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get a good response from people. Let me ask you this, because you just piqued something in my in my in my my mind. People in our community who have never had a positive experience with a police officer, right? And we know that exists yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Um, but you being able to t diffuse that is an important tool, and 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 it's an asset for your department to have you there because of that. But. I'm gonna throw it to you, Eric. But what about when there's somebody in our community who's never had a positive interaction with a, with a police officer, and there are police officers, mainly ones who are not black, who've never had a positive interaction with anybody in our community? How does that work? How do you, how do you diffuse that? And I'm not not labeling, not saying that all white cops are, are bad cops, all bad cops are white, right? Um, but there are people who work in our community that don't know anything about it, right? And so, how do you? Um, as a person from the community, with family in the community, with ties in the community, um, how do you narrate that process with your colleagues who don't know anything good about us? They know Eric's a cool guy, but they don't know anything about the neighborhood Eric grew up in and, and the people who live there other than they're there to patrol them. Uh, basically having conversations with them, um, just like we got to start having conversations with the community. We got to talk to our coworkers as well, which I do often, you know, just because, you know, somebody looks a certain way, you can't automatically label them as a criminal or a bad person. And um, it was one training that they did that I actually enjoyed and took from the police department, and that was this implicit bias training. So with implicit bias is basically, uh, we could use black officers and white people. So a black officer works in the ninth district for 15 plus years. The only type of people he ends up arresting are, for example, Caucasian males with tattoos all over their face and blonde hair, blue eyes. So for 15 years, he continuously arrests those type of people. So it's going to be in his mind that when he sees that person, that's what's going to come with it. He's going to either that person going to have a gun on them, drugs, or they about to commit a crime or they already did. So with that training, they training that you have to break that in your mind and they gave you different exercises and things because not everybody is a criminal. Like we, we just like we all dress today, we could be walking down the street and we could get mistaken very quickly for a person that just committed a crime because we fit the description. But you can't come at people that way. So. Sometimes I'm in the car with people and I'm explaining to them, you know, they'll they'll say a remark like, oh, I bet you he up to no good. And I'm like, you know, one 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 time we were um, driving down the street. We saw a group of kids and it was it was crazy how he implied something. And I implied something. It was a group of kids. They all had the same gym shoes wrapped around their neck, hanging on their neck and they walking down the street. 
and I hear a statement like, oh, they probably just stole those shoes. But it's in my mind, right, in my mind, I'm right. like, that's a basketball team. I'm like, what, what make you think that? He was like, because they all got the same shoes. I'm like, that's probably a basketball team, you know. You got you to gotta take the good with the bad. That's not always, you know, criminals. That's a basketball team. Because when I, when I played basketball, we all got the same team shoes. And I'm explaining it to him. He's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's something to think about. But I really feel like that responsibility falls on the coworkers. Like, we got to start talking to them and having these conversations so that they see everybody's not a criminal. Even when I arrest people with these aggravated crimes, drugs, guns, a lot of these guys are intelligent. They just got the wrong mindset. You have conversations with them, and you're like, man, why are you doing the stuff that you're doing? And sometimes they can't even answer. I, I, they, Eric, yeah. Eric, you said something that uh, hit me because I remember being in a squad car. And, and it, it was a talk, but basically it was three of us. We was working as uh, plain clothes, slick boys or whatever. It was me and another guy, black guy, and a white guy who was sitting behind. Now we all on the same team. I'm in the car with this other brother and this, and this other white officer, and we sitting there in the car, and the black officer says to me out loud, everybody can hear, I am sick of these niggas. What? That's th this came out of his mouth, and mm -hmm. I'm sitting there like, no, he didn't. And I know I can't turn around right to see if the white guy was listening, is, right? But I know he's like, oh, let me see where this is going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me see what this going, what's yeah, going to happen with this. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, okay. I, so I, I flipped the script. I said, you sick of what? He said, you heard me. I'm sick of these niggas. I said, what, what, what niggas you talking about? He said, the ones that's out here that we gotta be dealing with every day. I said, okay, I said, what you telling me is that we going maybe three houses on our entire block. We go there consistently, three houses. I say, say it's 30 houses on that block. You trying to tell me these other 27 houses that you never been in, they're niggas? Mm -hmm. Is that what you telling me? No, that's not what I'm saying. I said, well, the reason why I asked him that, and I said, because, you know, my mother stayed right around the corner. I said, are you calling my, <laughs> my mother? mother. <laughs> and I was saying that yeah. before the guy behind me could hear this. Yeah. So he was like, no, nah, you know I ain't talking about your mother, man. I said, you said everybody over here was a nigga. Mm -hmm. I said, so I'm trying to get you to understand what you put out there yeah. is perception, and mm -hmm. other people are going to receive it. And if they see us having this kind of dialogue where somebody's calling somebody a nigga and you saying it's okay, then they're going to take that and register that and in their head and they're going to say, oh, they think they're niggas and I might as well think they're niggas too. That is my main problem with the term black on black violence. I hate that term. I don't know how y'all feel about well, it, but crime is crime. Are you mad at crime or are you mad at black people? You understand what I'm saying? That's a good question. Well, That's I, a, I, and, I, and right and wrong. Right, I, I, like crime I is crime. Don't care what color the person is. And right on the FBI wrong. statistics, That's I looked it up. Like 1,600 yeah, 1600 white people killed other white people. Like there's no universal term that we all know for. And 1,300 black people killed right. black people. So well, who I, committed I, more murder? I don't that know was who the case. came up with the term. I really don't. But propaganda. I, I did propaganda. see something today where it says. 85% of white people are killed by white people. Mm. But you don't hear them say this is white on white crime. It's, it's because in, in, this, in this country, we have always looked at criminality through the lens of black men, right. period. Right, that, that has always been the way we've defined crime and what a criminal is. Uh, and so therefore, that gives fodder to that, to that narrative. Um, and it was it was the way it was that way it was, it's that way right now it's that way with the war on drugs it was that way with jim crow laws it was that way with slave patrols it's been that way in this country forever and so i mean that's the reason why if you ask me and most people just commit crimes unfortunately to people that they look like right right you, that's who you're around that's who you know. if you most crime have, have have been a former law enforcement officer you know, I, I, there was a white general who said it's better to run to come back to fight. MacArthur said it's better to run today than come back to fight another day. I think what I've seen, because I, you know, I never had, I really didn't have a confrontation 
in the manner that, that I see officers today have. You know, everybody wants to say they have rights. I said, but you have to understand, now I'm going to speak in the mind of a police officer that's out there working on a beat. Uh, and, and also give a, a experience before I was, I, a, a good experience before I was the police, was I had a, a 286. I, had, I, was, I was teaching in Indiana, and I went, I guess you call it Old Town, New Town, uh, someplace down there. And it was like about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, and I was living in Gary, and I was trying to get back. And so right there, when you come around Chinatown, you know, it, it opens up, the expressway opens up. So it's like, I'm looking in front of me, I don't see nothing. I said, I just bought this car. I don't know what, it's, what it can do. I'm about to find out. <laughs> so I'm in third gear. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the RPMs and it's winding up and some, I looked in the rearview mirror and I said, Dad, that car moving behind me, ain't got no lights on. I said, let me get ready to hit it in the fourth gear cause I'm finna smoke. <laughs> and before I hit the fourth gear, the blue lights popped on, boop, and the, he pulled me over. And it was two two white guys about my side, it was right there on the damn ride. So I was like, I got out the car, and I was like, yeah, I said, you got me? I said, you got me real good, officer. I said, uh, I saw you at the last minute because I was finna hit that fourth gear. <laughs> and because uh, I was finna smoke you, I said, but, I said, but can I ask you a question before you do anything? How fast was I going? <laughs> and they looked at me. They said, you, you serious, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. I said, I know I was speeding. They ain't going to sit up and lie to you. I know I was speeding. How, how fast was I going? I just wanted to know it before I, because I didn't get that fourth gear. He said, man, he said, I don't really know. We were too busy trying to catch you. That's, that was his answer to me. He said, but because you are, you are just brutally honest with us about this, I'm still going to write you this ticket. I said, okay, give me the ticket. I understand. He said, but. I'm not going to show up in court. Wow. I said, for real? He said, yeah. Now, fast forward to the day, I don't think an officer could have done that because it would have been camp. It would have been film. Oh. So a lot of the discretion that oh, some man. officers have had in the past has been completely taken away from them. Go by the book. Well, exactly. I, I, and, and I'm not saying that's bad oh. because the stuff that just so you know, I, you two know, but my, my nephew before uh, uh, what, Laquan yeah, and, I remember. and right after Trayvon, my nephew who was 23 was shot and murdered by the Memphis police, the police Department. department. Yeah. yeah, he was shot 23 times while he was asleep in his car. Yeah. So it's not like I don't know nothing about violence to a family member, okay? But, but, I, I, but it was no video. Yeah. It was no video. So, we I, we going to visit my aunt, and um, it, it's like not St. Louis. It's like a little suburb right by St. Louis. Yeah. So, my yeah. wife is driving. In the county. Yeah, my wife driving. It's, I got three generations of women with me. My wife, my grandmother, my daughter. She, three months. Mm. I'm in the back seat with her, you know. Um, not in my car, it's in another car, my wife. So my wife and my grandma in the front seat, her headlight was out. So the officer come up to him and he tell her like, I'm not about to write you a ticket. He was cool. It was a young white guy. So I'm not about to write you a ticket. Uh, I just need to see your license registration, insurance or whatever. So she, she give him her license and she looking for insurance. We, we on the same insurance plan, uh, you know, same right. plan. Mm -hmm. So uh, the windows is kind of tinted in the back not like extra factory right. how it comes yep. and um my, my grandma and my, my wife in the front she's still looking for the insurance so after a while it's probably like four or five minutes six minutes i'm like uh, i i have I, I got an insurance card i said loud enough so that he wouldn't be startled, startled by me yeah. saying that. right uh, roll the window down I'm like, okay i roll the window down now it's my three month old baby this baby means everything right you know what i'm saying and now your uncle's gone when you see my face. Yep. Yeah. Now he needs to see my ID. Like I'm in the, You in the back seat. I tried to say, I said I'm in the and I was like, if he killed me, it ain't just gonna kill me. He's gonna shoot my damn orders. Right. Right here by right. Me. And uh 
Now, now I'm, I'm in this car, and uh, uh, it's three generations of women in the car, and I can't protect them from this man. That's a bad feeling. Yeah. Right. That's a bad feeling. It, re it really is. First thing they would say is that uh, they wanted to identify you because they wouldn't fear their life. That's what I've heard, and I'm pretty sure other people have heard that too. You know, it's like, well, I just want to... It's like, no, they, they've grown up with this ideology. If, if, you're, if you're black, you, you committed some kind of crime or you're about to commit some kind of crime. And that's why I, I, I think, it, you know, I'm so proud that you all are police officers and, and trying because a lot, a lot of regular civilian people don't understand the goldfish bowl that you live in. Right. And what I mean by that is that you, you, it's, it's, it's a juggling act, you know, because you, you still a black man and you can, I, I have walked into rooms with people who I have trained of the other sex, I mean, other ethnic group, and they would not speak to me knowing that I trained them and made them qualified for the job that they are doing right now. And they be out in the neighborhoods with their counterparts ripping off my people. Mm. On the um, on the more black or black people policing black people piece, right? There's a lot of conversation now, especially in, in my circles, about the test and whether it's the, the the drug part of it or the criminal background check part of it, or I've been hearing a lot about the psych test now or the polygraph that is set up against us and there's credit checks. I be credit, credit checks. I even have my own. They're doing credit checks? Yeah, that's what yeah. A lot of people not getting on the colleagues who said they made it to the end and they can't. Are you um, serious? But see, just like what you said, if you go back and you talk to them, you get your credit repaired and then you go back and talk to them and show them and, and you know, you get tell it. you you might go yeah. further with legal action. Right. Then they clear that up. But a lot of people I done met yeah, my credit wasn't good enough for me to get on. Somebody was saying that police community relations broke down with the advent of the motorized squad car. Mm. And the reason behind that was that before then, the beat cop was on his, on his feet. He was walking around the neighborhood and he knew Dono. He knew Dono's mom. He knew, you know, uh, Marcus and he knew where he went to school at. Um, he said, but now you put the police car into it and every time you have contact with somebody, it's because there's something wrong. Every every time you see somebody, there's an issue. And many of those are mental. Many, many of those are mental health calls, right? Well, a, a lot of them. Are, but no, say, say what? Say that. Every every time. So instead of every time I see Eric, it being me seeing Eric as a person. Every time I see Eric, it's because I'm going I'm going from hot spot to hot spot. And every every time I see a person, it's right. because something's wrong. Exactly. Can you have community policing without in in, in this type of era? You yes, definitely you can. can. Yeah. And I, I feel like I'm on the tag team, and uh, it just so happens that our tag team is predominantly black. It's a black sergeant. Uh, all of the tag members are black. And, but one thing my sergeant does is different. As we get out the car, we'll go up and down 35th Street, which is right by headquarters, and you know it's a lot of drug sales mm -hmm. going on over there. But we still get out the car and we talk to the people. And you would be surprised at how many people go past and like, oh, how you doing? Thanks for being out here. And these are community members. These aren't just people passing through. And it's it's crazy. And and even sometimes when I'm driving, even if it's a, a guy that I arrested with a gun, I still have a conversation. How you doing? We're well, staying out of well, trouble. See, see the I see y'all are, not y'all specifically right, at right, this right, table, right. You, but... All the things that, like, the, the anger that's directed towards police right now, it's at police for every interaction somebody has had with a police officer yes, that was negative. Yeah. But, but more importantly, it's about white supremacy at the end of the day. Yeah. When you look at the whole thing, it, it, it all boils down well, to that, white supremacy. That, that, at the that, end that, of the that, day, that, it's all That's, that's true. That's real talk. That's real. Because, see, the whole thing, it all came to a head that eight minutes and 46 seconds, yeah. when everybody saw Floyd being pressed on by his neck and and he that man begged for his life and that officer refused to acknowledge the fact he, that he was he, a human he being. called he's a 46 year old man that had to call call his mother he is calling dead. his mother his dead mother's his dead mother's, mother's name past that point i think he speaks to the legislative economic status we hold in america 
they refuse to acknowledge us as human beings they, a lot of the time. With knee on that. With knee on that. With, with, yeah, with, with knee on that. With, 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 but just, that's the whole thing. How can, you know, because I, I had, a, you know, this dude that works with me, you know, we had a big falling out. Because I kept trying to explain to him, dude, I said, I don't care what he did. I said, the fact is that he had his knee on his neck. I said, he's still a human being. I said, you ain't got to like him, but he's still supposed to get his due process. But And he never got an opportunity because you took it upon yourself. You squashed him like I just squashed this little green thing that came on my arm. Yeah. You have no remorse, no feelings for the, uh, another because... Just to piggyback off what you said, as soon as you let that window down in the back and he saw your skin color, oh, it, was it was like, hey, was uh, and, let me and see your... And I'm, I'm, yep. I'm going to assume this. You tell me if I'm wrong. You, the 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 rush of emotion came um, because of the situation. And when I say that, I mean because you were in the car with, with three generational women, um, including your baby girl, who you could not protect at that point, right? He could protect but, her. But you 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 pull them out of the con out the car and put us all in it, and that would have been a normal and natural yeah, yeah, for you, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, right. And, and and that's the thing, right? Just the, the fact that this is normalized for all of us, mm -hmm. um, I think is problematic. When the when the thing happened to me at the store in the South Loop with the cop and the mask, and he told me I look suspicious, and are you sure you about that? I, I said I look suspicious. I can't see your face. You look suspicious. All right. Mask, it's called it's called COVID, but. Right. Yeah. Um, when that happened to me, I went home like nothing happened. I went home, I talked on the phone, um, I had dinner, I watched The Last Dance, uh, uh, the Michael Jordan joint on, on ESPN, yeah. and it wasn't until later on that night, I was like, yo, and I, and I felt, I keep saying this, I felt uncomfortable that I was so comfortable. Right. I, I know any of my white friends or colleagues had that happen to them. We rapped a lot about the current state of affairs, um, and we, I'm glad we did touch on the fact that the things that are going on in our community come from lack of, invest, lack of investment. We talked about reparations, we talked about um, housing uh, and, and all that. And so when I think about this subject, I think it's one thing to stop cops from killing us, right? But then I think the, on the second hand is just because you're not dead doesn't mean you're alive, right? So, so how do we live? And, and I think we all got it some kind of a part to play in that. I don't know what that looks like though. All right? And uh, that's a, a lot of why I want to have this conversation with y'all because I trust your, your thought process. I trust the things that you've been through and, 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 and the logic that you put behind your, your ideas. So, I mean, what, next steps, what, like, what, what, what do you think, man? You, you in the schools every day, you, you get them early, right? right. And, and you have the, I think, ability to move the needle on some of these young folks. And how do we remind them who they are? Remind them that they're kings and queens, um, yeah. and uh, just move to the next level so we, we're, we're not treated like this anymore. So first of all, I believe in, um, I guess, I don't know where Marshawn Lynch got this from, but he did a dope interview. He said, you want to go far, you go together, yeah. to some extent, right? go fast, go alone. Yeah, 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 right. So if we go fast, go alone. If we go far, go together. So at this stage, when I have an opportunity to First of all, you gotta carry yourself in a certain way. If you wanna show them that they are kings and queens as a black man and, and as black women, you have to carry yourself in that way. So my, my main goal is to make sure that I'm presenting myself in the best way possible and to be able to have authentic conversations to relate my experiences with dealing with the police or with being black at a predominantly white institution or coming from an area similar to them, right? And still having the opportunity to make decisions and make my life as to where I wanted it to be. You know what I mean? So. My, my, my main focus outside of that is being able to organize groups within our communities to work together and have a, a synergy. Because if you have groups that are different, but the bigger picture or the larger goal in mind is, is, is the same or similar, you can do major things, man. You can change the whole community. But it only can happen if the, the people within that community work together and understand how their, their, their power as a, as a collective is stronger than their, than their strength as an individual. Yeah, Eric. How, what what can happen? What can we do? All right. I mean, people at this table, a lot, the larger community. What, what can we do to move the needle um, to improve the relations between law enforcement and our community 
on both sides, right? What, what, what? I don't want to make a, a, a false, um, kind of a false analogy type of situation, but I, mean, I, I want to know once again, one, what, what can happen so that no, this does not happen in this city. Like right now, everybody was up in arms because of Minneapolis, right? But we know it's happened in Chicago a million times. We 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 cannot even name all the the people um, who suffered their fate. What can we do differently? Um, it's a few things. So what I do on my end, like I was saying, is when even when we arrest them, I still treat them like a human. I treat them with respect. Once once that incident is over, you get under arrest. No matter if you ran from me, fought with me, whatever. Once I get you under arrest, I have conversations with them. And it, it was a kid that I chased, and he literally pulled the gun out because he was scared. He didn't aim at me, but he pulled. He turned around, pulled the gun out, and placed it on the ground because, and they, in their head, as long as the gun is not on them, you know, they won't get as bad of a charge. And I, I literally jumped. I was like, oh no, oh no. And I'm saying, oh no, because I'm like, I'm about to get shot for the first time. And I'm schooling over trying to get my gun out. And once he placed on the ground, I put my gun up, I put him on the ground, I put him in cuffs. I'm like, dude, what, what are you thinking? Like, you could have gotten shot. You can't do stuff like that. Even if you wrong, you gotta get on the ground, put your hands behind your back and deal with the consequences of the decision you made to walk around with a gun. And from there on, we had conversations and I told him, you know, think about doing other stuff, leave this long. He wasn't even a felon. I'm like, hopefully this doesn't stick to your background. You could progress in life, but leave this alone. It's not, it's not the lifestyle you wanna live. I, I initially, when I thought about doing this to bring everybody to the table, man, it, it was um, with all that was going on in, in Chicago right now, um, it made me think about, we talked a lot about protecting children, right? And uh, I think a society really loses its, um, its bearings when you're no longer able to protect kids. Marcus talked about how he felt when he felt like he couldn't protect his daughter. Um, I had a conversation with my mother recently about when she felt that she lost her innocence uh, as a as a youth, and both her and my dad said the same thing. It was when Emmett Till happened, right? Because up until that point, they didn't think kids could die, uh, and um, I, I remember certain things growing up in Chicago. <clears throat> they weren't necessarily related to the to the cops, but. I remember names that I'm, no, I'm sure everybody at this table will at least have some semblance of. I remember Lenar Clark, I remember Yummy, I remember Girl X, right? And those those three things stood out to me because that, that showed mortality for a kid to me. And like, as a kid, that's fucked up. You're not supposed to feel that way. Um, and so I think about all that and I think about the fact that, you know, when, Mc, when Laquan McDonald died, uh, uh, I cried. It bothered me. I didn't know him, but I felt like I did. And then when the George Floyd death happened, it angered me. I was intensely angered. And so from where I sit today, a lot of what I've been committing myself to is calling systems out, calling out um, you know, these, these, uh, these inequities that are all around us, calling my colleagues out, like, listen, what are you gonna do? Let's stop talking about it. Let's be about it. Let's do something like, you know, to, to actually um, effectuate some real change. Jerron, I know like you think about this a lot in a bunch of different aspects. We, we've had conversations about all of this, um, the, the politics behind it, the legality ar around it, um, the civic, civic and the social uh, pieces of it. What, as, a, as a, uh, a black man who grew up here in this city, who spent the last 14 years on the police force, um, what do you think people like me can do? Like, like what the, the, the decision makers, like what, what is our role? To be honest with you, that's a conversation that I just had with a, a group of individuals. You got aldermen. Each alderman, you got 50 aldermen. They're supposed to be in control of 2% of the city's population. You get these funds that they're supposed to spend in uh, infrastructure and things like that. You get state reps supposed to make these laws. You know, and sometimes I wonder, 
what input do they get from their constituents? You know, because we vote for these people. I mean, I believe some of these people haven't done anything because it shows, you know, I mean, we talk, like you say, a lot of people do a lot of talking, but where's the proof? You know, Cam, a couple years ago, and it's a small thing, you know, like you said, your block, that's what you can control. You can't control, you're not the mayor, you're not the alderman, but what you can control, you control. Cam sent me a, a text about two summers ago, two, three summers ago. He, the weight room was terrible. And he's like, man, we gotta do something. Did a couple fundraisers, he donated some money, I donated some money, got a couple of other people. Um, they got a new weight room. That's something small. You know, you can't control things that you have no control over. But on the small level, we have to hold the aldermen more accountable. You know, they need to have to get back to these beat meetings, community policing. And those aldermen need to be present. Not a representative, but the aldermen. Listen to what the people are complaining about. Because a lot of this stuff kind of goes hand in hand. And then that alderman becomes a different voice because, you know what, they're tired of their constituents complaining about certain things. So they, in turn, hold the, the police commander for those districts more accountable. Now, that rolls uphill. Now the mayor, instead of just sitting there, I mean, your post on social media, that's cute. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure the mayor, the governor, the president is out, out reading those posts. Mm -hmm. But if that alderman is getting bombarded, then those aldermen now are going to be like, man, I have to really be in this office. I have to really do my job for my constituents because they're voicing their opinions. You know, I know the alderman of my ward, so all she did was campaign for the seniors. Because why are the seniors going to vote? The ward, the Woodline, I think the alderman won with 700 some votes. You mean to tell me only 700 people? That's it's way more people than that in Woodline. So 700 people decided who's going to be the alderman. Who's going to have the control over that 2% and those TIF funds and things like that that can really, that really can change that area. You know, so you in that position, you have a duty to uphold, just like I have a duty, you have a duty, we all do. And we can only More control, right, mm -hmm. we can all, right, we all, but we can only control what's, you know, some people, well, the mayor should do this. Well, does the mayor have the power to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, does the police have the power to do certain things? You know, you, I mean, I'm sure you get people that tell you, oh, you should do this and do that. You're like, mm -hmm. well, that's kind of out of my realm of, yeah. of, of control. So I think we just have to understand how politics works so we can attack it. Yeah. Our FOP, I'm just my last point, our <laughs> FOP kind of, you know, whatever. I had made complaints about it, but you know what I said? How can I make complaints about it and I ain't never been to a meeting? So yeah. Two weeks ago, I went to my you first did. meeting. You did, I saw you on your way there. I was walking down the street. I went to my yeah. first meeting, you know what? I said, I can't complain about something that I don't have an idea how it works. Mm -hmm. So let me understand the game before I try to play the game. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Pop. Yes, sir. Two plus decades in this, yeah. all right? Um, seen it all, seen, seen people come and go, seen um, new reform agendas come and go, seen mayors come and go, seen consent decrees come and go, and all the, the stuff that comes with um, policing and living in a, in, a, in a big city. What, uh, what gems, what, 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 what things would you give on, uh, late, leave with us as, as younger black men in this city taking up the mantle, these guys, uh, you know, working in the streets, um, Marcus working in his community, Dono working in the schools, me as a legislator, what, what, what do we have to do to change all this, this entire narrative? <coughs> it means, <coughs> excuse me, cops, uh, cops versus us, us versus us. What, what, what do we do? Th that's a large hill to go mm -hmm. up uh, but the biggest thing I think you have to be sincere you you have to be um, consistent you can't be one way one day and the next way another day you, who you have to be true to who you are because even though you may not want to be a role model you are a role model even though you don't think somebody's paying attention to you, they are paying attention to you. And everything you do that you may not think anybody else is watching, somebody else is seeing. Uh, as far as, you know, you voting, I would tell everybody, you gotta vote. You gotta vote. 
it may not be the person that you want, uh, but you, you, that's, that's this process that we have. Um, it, it don't take much, you know, for some people, but, but community policing, it, it's definitely needed. Uh, and, and, you know, getting the alderman out is, it would be a plus. But more, more importantly, uh, just being, being, being in person, not, I mean, not, you know, everybody can see the uniform. Kids can tell if you're sincere. People, kids can tell. You, you, can fake it, you can fake it with any adult, but a kid is going to see right through you. First of all, as black men, we, we have to be more respectful of each other. We, we, you know, it's one thing to, to, to have this kind of dialogue, but we also have to just be respectful of each other and, and just try to show. It's a, a good example, and it wasn't just because I was on the west side, but I, it was a brother who I saw on the west side that had dreadlocks. And I was like, I'm, I wasn't lost, but I couldn't find a damn house. So I was like, I don't want to lose. I couldn't find it. <laughs> well, I, was, I couldn't find the house. I know it was somewhere in the area, but you know, I was in the area. So I was like, okay, I'm going I'm to ask this guy, you know, just to see what he's on. What he's on. And uh, he was more articulate than me. And uh, he was a young brother, you know, and he was on his way to work or school or somewhere. And he, he answered all my questions that I had. And he dispelled the myth about young brothers with dreadlocks, you know, because I'm. And then I had to reflect back on myself because now I don't have no hair. But when I had a big old afro, you know, that was the thing. And the last thing I was going to say, is, you know, we need more money because without money, you can't do nothing. And, at this, and then on top of that, I would. It had never happened, but the biggest mistake we made was when we started following people of other color. When we decided that, when we forgot that what we had as a base was more, if we would have stayed within ourselves and, and kept everything within ourselves instead of going out here to move towards somebody else, because it would have been tight. Because then I could have, I could have been gone. I, I didn't have to be here. Yeah. But you could have been there saying, hey, man, your shorty's out here acting a fool. You know, your shorty's out here acting a fool. So, you know, I'm telling you, and it's like, I ain't got to question it because I know what your character's all about. Yeah. Or you like, let me take your boys and teach them how to swim, teach them how to play tennis. You know, but now you got everybody out here, you don't trust nobody. And all our kids can't play in the streets because you're worried about them getting shot. Getting shot. I heard something early in this and this kind of civil unrest stuff that um, stuck with me. And the phrase, the, the, the quote was, uh, the past is not our fault, but the future will be. And I feel like you live that. I feel like you embody that, right? Um, because you've taken the bull by the horns and you really locked into your community and your people and you're like, let's do what we can do and figure the rest of it out, right? Um, as you look at the future and what it looks like for us, as you, as you look at, you know, us creating a, a situation where, where we're, we're standing up, right? And we talked about this, this time is, it feels different, right? And I said it has to be different because we, we, we have no other choice. Um, as, as, as we have the conversations and do the work to create a, a playing field where we are not burying young black boys who die at the hands of, of the city or the state or the, or the county law enforcement, um, after we we address that with the work you're doing about pouring back into our community and back into our, our young people, our babies especially, how do we wrap that all together? How do we find connectivity and like just not let this be this one thing over here and this be something that's divergent? How, how do we find it, the, 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 the way to connect that and to create a nexus there? I think what you were talking about organization, um, I think we, we need to unite under one umbrella specifically for certain concerns, even if it's just one at a time. Like, that's why I think Black Lives Matter, because the ideology behind it might not be something that you particularly are jumping up and down for, but stop killing us is something, it's just one thing everybody can get on board with. You know what I'm saying? Like, we just get one idea we can agree on, get on board there. <clears throat> solve that problem, move to the next. You know what I mean? Like, I, I go on blocks a lot of the time. Like, I don't have no problem pulling up on no block anywhere. You know, 
because respect, right? Like, I'm gonna talk to, I'm a, so I'm in Humble Park. Uh, during the Puerto Rico Day Parade, I hit the alley, 15, 20 kings in the back. The younger king gang banging, you know what I'm saying? I came back up out the alley, I'm not, I ain't really with the running. Mm -hmm. So I pulled forward, he gang banged, I'm like, bro, I'm a grown man. Like, what you is? I'm a, I'm a man. I'm a man before I'm anything. You know what I'm saying? And I came back here with no mal intent for y'all. If anything, we supposed to be together. I talked to them for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and you know what's going on with, you know what I'm saying, yeah, right. if you look on the internet. It's, he like, man, tell your people we ain't on that. I say, man, you, you preach it to the choir. I think that, like, the, the way algorithms are set up, turn us against each other because they, they desensitize us to violence and then they'll they'll throw in your feed things that'll turn you against the other person. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And that's the, the tenements of how you control 90% of the people. With five people, you have to create small collective groups that you can then cause to become tribal and fight against each other. But if you have to fight against 90% of the the idea, you know what I'm saying? You you overwhelmingly <clears throat> overpower the idea that creates the destruction within us. Economics, for the long-term solution, economics has to occur. Drugs, basketball, or rap. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. I can rap like a, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I can hoop like, and you know, I'm, <laughs> so, in life, you know, at one point in life, I, I fell victim to it, you know what I'm saying? And again, perception shapes the reality. But your perception is the things you view, interpret, and how those things out, you know what I'm saying, reflect out. When the outside entity controls who can get on with rap, then of course you're gonna have 100 chief keeps because that's the only person that y'all let really fly. You know what I'm saying? Like, I. My, my, my mother, she ain't really like that mentally. My father locked up. So the police is the ops. You lock my father up. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's nothing you can tell me when you lock my parent up. Right. I don't care about you at that point. You're my enemy because right. you've locked my parent up. I'm a child. I got to go to sleep every night with no father. And for right or wrong, we all know this. Kids going to side with their parents. Yeah. Like, so what? Well, when but parents need to stop telling their kids that if you do something, gonna I'm going to have the police to get mm -hmm. you. That's a They're fact. making the police the boogie, the boogie man. That's a fact. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a fact. Yeah, I, I, and I, oh, and I used to correct them. That's a fact. I used to correct them all the time. That's a fact. Like, that hey, that's not my job. Mm -hmm. I'm not the boogeyman. I'm not here to come yeah. get your kid. That's your job to discipline your kid. Yeah. But they do it. Parents do it all the time. I think it's subconscious though. too because they don't I don't I don't think all parents think about they don't think about how saying it, it could and the impact affect it, it has. exactly but they say it they say it easy yeah um you know one thing that I'm I'm happy about that I'm taking away from this is that this whole conversation had kind of the tilt of of um not woe is us Right, not you know we're we're victims even though in this and the thing that we came here to talk about is is a victimization of us, All right? But I just sat down with with five strong black men who are talking about yo, this is aggressive. I, we're, we're we're not going to be in this spot anymore, and we're moving here because we're not asking anymore. We're, we're telling folks that's that, that this shit's that's gonna change. Fact, yeah. yeah, and man, I appreciate you brothers and all the work that you that you've done and continue to do, and um, you know hopefully we can do this again this was i think it was it was uh it was helpful for me uh thanks